Greetings from Lord British. Many of you also have learned by now that my real name is Richard Garriott. Uh, tonight I'd like to talk to you about the history of the Ultima series. Uh, I'd like to send my greetings, of course, first out to those of you who have been playing Ultimas now for 10 years. This is the 10th year anniversary of Ultima, and I would especially like to thank those of you who have been with me now for those many years. But also, of course, I'd like to extend my greetings and thank you to the new players, those for whom either this is their first or one of their first Ultimas played yet. Uh, Ultimas for me have been a very big part of my life, a very meaningful part of my life, uh, and I hope that you will find the experience of playing them to also have some meaning for you. Like we said, this is now, of course, the tenth year of Ultimas, and at the ripe old age of 28, that puts it back at the age of 18, really, when I was first working on a series called Ultima. But, uh, so you can understand how that's really been a major influence in my life as well, considering it has essentially consumed all of my adult life. I consider myself really quite fortunate for the many breaks which have fallen my way down through the years, but I'm sure you will also understand the great deal of work and effort which has uh, gone into these games. For me now, after 10 years, Ultima is really more than just a game to me. It, it, it's very much a real part of my life. In many ways you can say Ultima has become my life. And the best way for you to understand that, which is what I, one of the things I'd like to relate to you tonight, is for you to understand the influences and forces in my life that were taking place prior to the beginning of the series, and also to understand the evolution of the series as it's gone on. To get to the beginning of the Ultima series, you really have to go well before the publication of the first Ultima, and you really need to go back to my freshman year in high school. It was in my freshman year in high school that I was first exposed to computers, uh, and very shortly thereafter, along with my exposure to computers, I was exposed to uh, two other major forces, one of which was uh, fantasy games, of course, like Dungeons and Dragons and Tunnels and Trolls, but also, uh, in the literary world, uh, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. And it was really those three things, which all three hit me at approximately the same time in my life, which really was the turning point of uh, what began my progression into what has now become uh, the uh, long history of Ultimas. Uh, through my high school career, the high school I went to really only offered one computer programming class, and so after taking one semester of the class, there was really nothing more you could do, and that, that first class was uh, only in basic. Uh, fortunately, however, I was a very active participant in science fairs at my school. In fact, I entered the science fair every year from my kindergarten year all the way to my senior year in high school. And it was through science fairs that I became very familiar with the faculty, and myself and two other students convinced the faculty that uh, we had a strong enough desire to learn programming that they let us have a class to ourselves with no teacher, no curriculum. All we had to do was have a project that we were working on and at the end of the semester, they would look at our progress on the project and uh, give us a grade accordingly. And so for the remaining three years of high school, I had as my project writing fantasy role-playing games upon the school's computer. Uh, during those three years, of, uh, the remaining last three years of high school, I actually wrote 28 small fantasy role-playing games. Many of them, of course, were never completed, uh, but really a, a fairly large number were. About, uh, I'd say about 10 of those 28 uh, actually made it through to completion and would run. And if you look at those programs, many of which I still have printouts of or the uh, paper tape, since I always had to do my work on paper tape in those days, uh, if you look at how those games operated, they have a very, very striking similarity to the modern day Ultimas. The way they would work is uh, at first the player would type in a command, say for instance to move north, and what you would get is the teletype would then print out a new list of a 10 by 10 or so area around the player where asterisks would be walls and letters would be these four monsters and little X's for doors, things of that nature, which if you think about the way tile graphics and Ultimals work even today, there's a striking similarity. It was uh, my senior year in high school, just after graduation from high school actually, that I went to work for a computer land store selling computers and was first exposed to the Apple computer. This was kind of the next big change because the Apple computer for the first time as opposed to having a paper tape reader and uh, uh, 10 character per second teletype for printing it out, it had graphics. Uh, when I first saw the Apple, I was inspired by a game that I saw called Escape, which I'm sure very few of you remember back then in 1979 or so. 
but Escape was a little 3D maze game. It was in low resolution block graphics where you had to walk around through a maze and then you could eventually find your way out. Well, inspired by those three dimensional graphics, I sat down and I said, hey, you know, I can do three dimensional graphics, but, but I can do it in high res graphics and with the much more detailed line drawings. And, and I wanted to take these 20, one of these 28 games that I already written over and over and over again. Really also, by the way, if it wasn't obvious through that period, that it was writing those games over and over and over again, which is the way that I taught myself to program. Well, I turned this around this again, and I began working on one on the Apple. So uh, it worked out, it took me really quite a bit of time, uh, most of the summer after my sophomore year in high school, to work out what perspective view graphics could be worked like. Uh, I was a big geometry student, I was, had a lot of fun with geometry, and uh, didn't have quite so much fun with, but I knew trigonometry and worked out mathematical perspectives, put together a small fantasy role-playing game, and I called it Akalabeth. And Akalabeth, uh, when I finished it, was really a game that I'd written for myself and for my friends to play, never really intending on having it published. But the owner of the Computerland store where we worked at said, hey, you know, you, you really ought to publish that. And uh, I don't know if any of you remember back then, but state-of-the-art packaging back in those days was a Ziploc bag and a cover sheet. And so I went out and I spent, at the time, what I thought was just an enormous amount of money, $200, to go down to the little print shop and had some uh, little cover sheets printed up and like a six-page manual, many of which actually I still have downstairs. I was just thumbing through those myself the other day. Uh, and uh, copied a bunch of discs, floppy discs themselves used to cost about $5 a piece for a blank disc when I used to have those. And so I copied myself up a bunch of them and started hanging them on the wall in a computer land store where I was working and uh, my games at Calabeth really looked just as high quality as any of the other games on the shelf because the other companies that were just getting started back then, the Broder Buns and California Pacific, uh, that was really the stage uh, that they were at as well. Well, in the first week that I was selling those, one of approximately eight copies that I sold there in that first week found its way through uh, someone who purchased it in Arizona who then mailed it on to California to a friend of theirs to a company called California Pacific. Uh, California Pacific, by the way, was the publisher for uh, an individual named Bill Budge, who I'm sure many of you do remember. Uh, he's still active today. Bill Budge, in the uh, late 70s, as far as I know, was the programmer. Uh, Bill Budge had three or four projects out, which uh, uh, I know I was a big fan of. I mean, if, if anything, I would have to say Bill Budge was my mentor of that era. Uh, well, I got a call one day from California Pacific saying there were plane tickets waiting for me at the, at the airport. So I flew to California and I signed a piece of paper and they started mailing me money. And that is literally exactly how I got into this industry. Uh, you could say very much accidentally, uh, but also of course it's turned out to be uh, uh, very, very fortunate for me indeed. Well, that first project through California Pacific did very well. I mean, Calabeth uh, sold uh, about 30,000 copies on the Apple, which uh, even for today is really a very large number of copies for uh, a, a title on one platform. Uh, however, and in fact, uh, the, the royalties that I collected on that game really were enough to pay for my entire college education. Well, I sat back after that and I said, gee, you know, if this project, which I wrote really for myself, never intended for public consumption, has done so well, I knew that if I just started over and worked on another project intending it for public consumption, that I could do a much better job. Uh, and of course, throughout high school, when I wrote those 28 games, what I'd been doing was really teaching myself to program. I knew I would write one game, I would learn a great deal by writing it, I'd throw it away to start the next one. And that's what I'd done 28 times through high school. That's really what a Calabeth was. And when I was through with a Calabeth, I threw it away and started in on the first Ultima. Well, the first Ultima, originally, in fact, was not going to be called Ultima. It was really going to be called Ultimatum. But prior to its release, we discovered that there was a board game called Ultimatum, and so we truncated that name to Ultima, which, in fact, now in the long run, I like a lot better. Uh, well, the first Ultima, as I was working in it, another interesting point about these is all these predecessors, all these 28 games plus the Calabeth, and the first Ultima were completely written in basic. Uh, as I was working on Ultima, there was one aspect of the game which I was really struggling with, which was how to represent the outdoors. I was getting the, the three-dimensional dungeons with the line drawings and things down pretty well, but I was having trouble with the outdoors. And that's where a good friend of mine, a man named Ken Arnold, comes in. Uh, Ken, who was another employee there at uh, the Computerland store where I was still working at this point, 
uh, it was really the person who I must credit with the invention of what I now call tile graphics, which is the visual representation that, that the Ultimas have had really through to the, through till to date, and uh, have been emulated and copied uh, throughout the world really at this point in other products. Uh, the first tile graphics that we worked on, though, of course, uh, what it is is it's a, a little uh, bit mapped image or a little bit of memory which is thrown up on the screen that graphically represents what the world can look like. Uh, in the current Ultimas, we have very sophisticated editors where we can uh, visually build those shapes uh, and while you're seeing them in usage. Well, in those earliest days, we actually had to draw the things out on graph paper, convert those graphs into binary numbers. Uh, because it was on an apple and the graphics on an apple are very strange, we had to actually reverse the binary numbers, convert those binary numbers into a stream of hex digits, enter those hex digits by hand into the computer, and then try running the program and see what it looked like. And if there was even one mistake, we had to start that entire process over for each and every one of those little tile right, tiles we wanted to build. One tile also, by the way, is, for instance, a piece of grass, a square of grass is what one tile was. And the first Ultima, we used about 32 tiles with which to create that world. Well, the first Ultima, when it finally came out, uh, which was uh, about a year later after First Calabath, about 10 years ago, uh, did significantly better than its predecessor, uh, Ult uh, Akalabeth, when it came out on the top 30 polls, just barely made it on the top 30 polls. The first Ultima broke the top 20 on the top 30 polls. Well, after the end of the first Ultima, that's when I sat back and said, hey, gee, you know, I've learned a great deal now about writing, you know, larger fantasy role-playing games here with this one. Gee, you know, if, if I only did it in machine language, I could do a lot better product. I could, it would be faster, I could fit more into the machine things of this nature. So that's when I began working on Ultima 2. Well, quite literally, Ultima 2 was the very first machine language program I ever wrote. I mean, I didn't learn it in school, I didn't learn it by writing other smaller things first. I stepped in cold turkey, having known only basic before in my whole life, and started in writing Ultima 2. Uh, there was a person named Tom Lures, who also worked for California Pacific at that point in time, who is a man who wrote a game for those who can have their Wayback Machines turned on, uh, named Appaloids, which was kind of an asteroids kind of a game but where you shoot up a uh, apples. And I was roommating with him over there at California Pacific, and it was really Tom who kind of handheld me through the, the uh, very painful process of coming up to speed on machine language. Ultima 2, of course, since I was learning a new language and since the size and scope of the game was significantly bigger than the original Ultima, uh, it took me quite a bit longer to create as well. In fact, Ultima 2, other than perhaps Ultima 6, was the one that took me the longest to work on. It took me about two years. Well, during that two-year period of time when I was working on it, a number of other things happened, the most significant of which was California Pacific, my original publisher, was going out of business. Uh, with them going out of business, of course, uh, I suddenly had to decide to go look for another publisher. Uh, I was very, very pleasantly surprised when when I finally did say, uh oh, I need to, I'm a free agent again, I need to start looking, I really had no idea of the success of the Ultima series had really become known to other publishers. And so I really got a call from most all of the other major publishers in the industry expressing some interest in publishing the next Ultima. However, back in those days, which was about 82 at this point in time, most of the games coming out on the marketplace in that period of time were essentially arcade game knockoffs, things, you know, the, the people who could come out with the, you know, as soon as a hot coin-op game came out, whoever got the first knockoff of it out usually made a fair bit of money, uh, and then usually there were two or three people that came out with a knockout knockoff of those of those games, but the later ones didn't really make much money. But but those games took people more like two or three months to create, whereas an Ultima was taking me, you know, nine months to two years to create, and so I had a much more personal tie to exactly how that product was dealt with when it was released into the marketplace. And so, when I was looking for a publisher for Ultima 2, I already had some very specific ideas about how I wanted that game presented to the public. Uh, most particularly was, for instance, I didn't want a Ziploc bag anymore, I wanted a box. Uh, I also wanted extensive documentation, and worst of all, I wanted a cloth map. And uh, when I got calls from all these publishers and I sent them back information about what I really wanted to do with my game, 
whenever they saw, particularly when they saw the claws, cloth map, it made virtually every publisher completely drop out of the race as far as even being remotely interested in publishing Ultima 2. And the only one that stuck around was Sierra. Uh, and Sierra, who at that time was called Online and later changed their name to Sierra Online, and now I believe has reduced their name back down to just Sierra. Uh, Sierra actually would put it in the contract that they would give me the box and the cloth map and all those things I wanted and that was really the principal reason that I moved over to Sierra for uh, for that product. In 1983, in the middle of the first major slump of the software industry, we decided to form Origin Systems. Now Origin Systems, like I said, was formed in the first slump, uh, which is really a pretty bad time to try to form a, a company in the middle of an industry slump. And the only reason we succeeded really at all was that our first product, what became uh, Ultima 3, of course, since it was already a well-known title, uh, it opened up many of the doors that were becoming closed to many of the other smaller or new companies emerging in the field. Now, Ultima 3's major changes over Ultima 2 were principally in the technology. Uh, that was where I introduced you know, multiple characters in your party, uh, separate uh, combat screens where detailed uh, combat could take place, where you could move your characters around, and uh, the, the gate travel and things of this nature that really made Ultima 3's big advancement uh, strictly technological. Well, of course, after finishing Ultima 3, I, of course, began work on Ultima 4. But that is really where I believe here, as we begin Ultima 4, where the major change uh, in the Ultima series began. Uh, and there's, a, there's really a great deal of what's happening in my personal and professional life that goes into what was happening right there at that instant in time. First of all, of course, since Ultima 3 was the first game that we published ourselves through Origin Systems, it was the first game through which that the people's responses, the, uh, the mail received by the users, fan mail if you want to call it that, that was the first time that I ever received that directly myself. And so it was the first time I got feedback directly from the players themselves. It's also, of course, the first time I received not only the mail of positive comments, but also the hate mail from the religious extremists and things of that nature. Uh, it's also the point in time where, let's see, if I look back to how old I was, it must have been at, ooh, at least 21 or 23, somewhere in that window by then. Uh, it's kind of the age of, uh, you could say, somewhat maturing as an individual. Uh, it was also a period of time where you begin to reflect on what I've now been doing already since 1976, and you begin to wonder if, uh, is this like just playing games, or how long is this going to go on? Is this a valid way to really make a living? Or, uh, you know, is this going to come to an end sometime soon? Uh, it was thought processes like that going through my head that really made Ultima 4 the turning point where I sat back and I said, look, you know, I've, I've learned how to program computers. I've learned how to write fantasy games. I, I've mastered the programming techniques now after doing it so many times. Uh, I now, I, I, the storylines that I put into the earliest Ultimas, which are still the storylines for the vast majority of my competitors and for the vast majority of these kinds of games, if not these kinds of fantasy movies, we're all kind of go out and slay the big evil bad guy wizard kind of scenario. Well, after regurgitating that scenario three times, you know, I was tired of working on uh, just hack and slash fight the monster kinds of games. Uh, even though, of course, I, I don't give any credence at all to the uh, extremists who claim that fantasy games are hurting their children and things of this nature, I was at least concerned enough to realize that based upon the letters I was getting back and just upon the quantity of people out there playing Ultimas, that in some way, even if in some only a very small way, I was touching the lives of hundreds of thousands of people who were playing my games. And with that came a sense of both uh, neatness and fun and, and having that kind of opportunity, but also a very real feeling of responsibility that must come with that. And so that was really the foundation of what started the story evolution of Ultima IV. Ultima 4 became a game where uh, there, there was no big evil antagonist to defeat. Uh, there, there was uh, no real great monsters to fight, uh, although there were some, there was of course some fighting and some swords and sorcery involved. The main focus of the game became changed dramatically. In this game, instead of having an antagonist, 
you were out to prove yourself to be a person of great virtue. Uh, I kind of equate it much more to something like uh, an Arthurian quest for the Holy Grail, where you know the evil wizards of the past are gone, and the people themselves, though of course they're still evil in the world, they're still thieves and brigands and people not treating each other right. And so you have to show the people the right way to live a life. And in Ultima 4, the computer essentially paid, played Big Brother, where as you moved around through the world and through your actions and deeds, which sometimes seem like very mundane deeds, like you know how when you buy and sell goods and when you talk to people, the computer would, without telling you, keep tally on when you would do things like when you would lie, when you would cheat, when you would take advantage of people, and also keep track of when you help people, when you went out of your way to do something nice for someone which didn't even necessarily help you in your direct physical quests. And in that way, by the game playing Big Brother, it could, it could watch your actions. And then much later in the game, when it came to time, basically when the reckoning day came, so to speak, it could sit back and it could judge you. And it could say, hey, look, you know, you're a really nice guy. You're doing really good. You're very valorous and strong. But boy, you're really a cheating scumbag. And so in that way, you could say, oh, gosh, you know, through my everyday repetitive actions, you could then have to, you could go into some shrines and meditate and find out exactly what things you could do in life uh, to exemplify the virtues that the game wanted to push. And another big thing was happening here. Ultimas were becoming bigger and bigger. And at this point in time, when we were working on Ultima 4, it was about halfway through working on Ultima 4 that it became very clear that I was never going to be able to finish this one on my own. And so for the first time, whereas each and every Ultima to date, I had worked on it almost completely exclusively, uh, I needed help. And so about halfway through the project, uh, one of our employees, a guy named Steve Muse, was brought in to assist in the completion of that project to make sure it could come out in something less than 10 years. This was very difficult and helpful at the same time, and it was very difficult to start to relinquish some of the control over some of the detail of what went into one of my own games, since I was so closely, personally tied to the game. But as it turns out, it was also something that was very necessary. When I first decided to build Ultima 4 into this very different kind of product, a product where it, there was no big antagonist, and where the principal focus of the game was to prove yourself to be a person of virtue, I was really very concerned over what the public and what the media reception to this game would be. Uh, I was concerned that people might think I was either getting on a soapbox or uh, concerned that people might have thought I'd gone way off the deep end and things of this nature. But I was, so even though I was very concerned, I was very pleasantly surprised when it did come out uh, that the, first of all, the, uh, the press was very more than kind to the project and the public reception was very strong. And it made number it made Ultima 4 my very first number one best-selling product. Uh, in fact, Ultima 4 did so well that uh, if you remember Billboard uh, magazine for uh, only about a year uh, used to cover the software industry. And for more than six months of their one year of covering the software industry, Ultima 4 held the top position in the uh, in their top listings. The uh, Although the reception to Ultima 4 was, of course, uh, very positive, it's kind of humorous to note what the few, if only, uh, negative reception seems to have been. And that was, in, in many, if not all, of the previous Ultimas, uh, many, many people took great joy, and after they finished the game, or when they started getting tired of playing it, they would start doing things like going around and slaughtering everyone in sight, or you know, raping and pillaging and plundering, so to speak, uh, all the towns and castles. And Ultima 4 was the first game where if you did take that path, it not only became impossible to win, but there were very negative circumstances that uh, surrounded that. Uh, which, was, of course, was the whole point of the game, but uh, there were a, a number of people out there in the world who really enjoyed playing their evil thief character and were a little frustrated that they couldn't do it this time around. But I considered that a, a minor drawback and uh, was overall very pleased with the direction it had taken. Well, that leads us up into Ultima 5. Uh, if I had to critique Ultima 4 from a, personally from a standpoint, of course, again, I'd mentioned that the programming was now an aspect which I felt I had pretty good control over, which is why Ultima 4 was really, the main focus of it was storytelling. Well, Ultima 4 was the first, my very first attempt at storytelling in a big way, so to speak. 
So Ultima 5 being my second time around to do large stories, I really feel was a much better told story. In Ultima 4, the story of virtue where you had to prove yourself to be a virtuous individual, all of the tests and all of the circumstances were fairly black and white. Uh, I mean, if, if it was something evil, you got rid of it. If it was something good, you took care of it. Uh, and the choices were fairly straightforward and simple. And the story itself, as it progressed, was fairly repetitive in my mind. Uh, there are many times where to, uh, for a certain kind of a quest, you had to do a similar quest for each of the different virtues. With Ultima 5, one of the first things I did was get more help. Uh, I actually started into Ultima 5 uh, with another programmer, John Miles, working with me on it from the very, very beginning. Uh, again, this was help was something that was still new to me, and so that was somewhat of a painful process as well, as that now we had two very different design philosophies and personalities struggling from the very beginning working together. Uh, but as it progressed, the logic and the uh, clear advantage to it uh, eventually became clear. From a play standpoint, one of the main advantages of Ultima 5 became very clear right from the outset. The storyline that we picked, first of all, was one where no longer was there really a black and white issue of good and evil. Uh, the basic scenario was that there was an antagonist who was while favoring the eight virtues which you proved to be good in the first uh, installment of this trilogy, Ultima IV, he had really taken these too far and had become much more like the Spanish Inquisition, very oppressive and very strict. And you became more of a Robin Hood style outlaw, working uh, behind the scenes against the government. Uh, but the people that you would meet with as you traveled throughout the world had very differing opinions on the whole situation. In any totalitarian or dic dic dictatorial uh, uh, system of government, there are many people who suffer as well as there are many people who benefit. And so, as you would go around through the world, you would team up some people who would definitely be against him and be in your favor. There would be some people who were very clearly on the opposite side, whose, for instance, businesses had thrived and crime was down, and were very much in favor of the new regime. And you'd meet many people who were kind of in the gray area in between, some of whom you might be able to, con to uh, convince to join your side of the struggle. Others who you might be think you had convinced to join your side of the struggle, but then later on would turn you into the bad guys, so to speak. And so the, the story unfolding and the way it unfolded and the kinds of quests and scenarios, I really feel had much more uh, significance uh, and depth and breadth to them. Uh, another one in particular, for instance, is that in most games, in most fantasy role-playing games, the antagonist is somebody who you are told in the instruction booklet is the uh, big evil wizard you're supposed to defeat, and so you travel around through the countryside collecting mag magic and money and treasure, usually taking advantage of the peasants along the way, never really seeing the bad guy take any advantage of the peasants, but then finally in the end you meet the bad guy who's really never done anything to you, and you go and you vanquish him, or her. Uh, what we did this time around is since we did have an antagonist, we wanted you to have some very personal, real-world reason for disliking him. Uh, so first of all, his effort, his effects and his efforts were felt throughout the kingdom, and you saw them in many way, ways and forms, in this case the Shadow Lords who were traveling about and doing evil and harm. Uh, and whenever you met up with him personally, he in fact uh, tries to sway you and convince you as to why what he's doing is really for the betterment of the people, but then in the end ends up wiping out, uh, I mean, quite literally killing one of the members of your party quite permanently. In most uh, games you can actually get things resurrected, so death wasn't really permanent. But in this case, death was permanent for your, your number one sidekick, the guy that had been with you from the beginning of time, since the first Ultima, uh, was removed forevermore. And so the depth and feel and the player personal involvement and the emotional response that went into the game uh, vastly exceeded its predecessors. The technological changes that went into Ultima are also very significant. Uh, if you look at the previous Ultimas, as each Ultima has grown and developed, uh, I believe very much, and I think few people will argue, with the quality and the quantity of play value that a player has received with each Ultima has gone up and up and up. However, there's also been one negative side to the Ultima development to date, which is as the Ultimas have become bigger and more and more sophisticated, 
they become more and more difficult for a beginning user to be able to uh, sit down and use uh, early on in his playtime. And so the ramp up time of learning it has become more significant, which has also made it more intimidating for a non Ultima player to begin playing with. Uh, so that was one of the main objectives with this Ultima, was since we now had a technology base which was more powerful than before, and having learned a few lessons from some of my competitors in the marketplace, uh, as well as learned a few lessons from some of our in-house products, and Chris Roberts and the Times Vlore project, uh, as well as Todd Porter and Knights of Legend, and Greg Malone and Mobius, all three have taught me many lessons as to uh, what the strong points of their games were. And, Admittedly, I've uh, borrowed ideas and concepts from them as well as others uh, to take Ultima 6 now and rebuild the technology from the ground up to build a technology which was extremely accessible to the beginning role-playing gamer as well as to the uh, serious long-time adventurer. One of the most obvious ways that's noticed is in the interface. Uh, Ultimas have always had a, a single keystroke command entry method, which I believe and still do, is a fast, efficient way to impart what your uh, desired activity to the computer. Uh, this time around, we scrapped all those 26 keyboard commands and replaced them with only 10 keyboard commands or icons. Uh, for instance, as the Ultimas evolved, you used to be able to do things like ignite a torch and peer at a gym and jimmy a lock with a key. And then eventually I ran out of keys, so I had to use a few others, like use the sextant and use a crystal ball. But then it became very obvious that those other three, igniting a torch, is really like using a torch, and using a magic gem, and using a key. And so I could reduce the command structure very dramatically down to only about ten commands. And with no loss of functionality whatsoever, uh, but just a simplification such that uh, it's much easier to learn, it's easier to use, it's quicker to understand. Uh, and I really believe has made this Ultima really, even though it's the largest and most sophisticated to date, I actually believe it is the easiest of all of them to play. In the creation of the world, uh, previous Ultimas have had towns and castles and dungeons and combat screens, uh, each one of which uh, has had, uh, from a coding standpoint, we've had to write the ability to get to all 26 commands had to function in each of these five different environments, which means each line, each kind of piece of code had to be rewritten five times, making it very prone to bugs and very difficult to write and just quantity to write. From a player's standpoint, they had to learn how to interact with things in each of these five different environments, making it more complex for the player. But that's another one of the main changes are, as we said, we threw away all five different kinds of environments and we reduced the world to one monoscale single environment where all actions, combats, and interactions take place all within that one physical kind of environment. No longer to go in and out of town. You just walk out of the gateways of one town, keep walking down the road until you walk into the buildings or gateways of another town. Uh, conversations, the people themselves the, within the world. Uh, in previous Ultimas, Ultima 4 was really the start of our interactive conversation where you could begin to ask people questions about themselves. Ultima 5 expanded upon it significantly, but in Ultima 6 we actually took where there used to be a limitation of about uh, 1k of memory dedicated to an individual's personality, which was their conversation. We made there now to where there is literally no limit on the size that a single individual's personality or conversation can be. Additionally, the people in your own party uh, in previous Ultimas, the other members of your own party were really just extensions of yourself where you fully controlled each and every one of their actions so that even though there were some characters like Yolo and Shamano and Dupre who have been with you since the very first Ultima, as soon as they have joined your party, really their personal personalities have really disappeared. They've really become part of yourself. In this Ultima, they take on much more of their own personalities. So, for instance, not only in combat can they fight for themselves, which is, a, is, is one major aspect of it, but more importantly, in conversations as you walk around the world and talk to other people, they can chime in whenever they choose and make full commentary. So, for instance, Dupre is your gung-ho fighter, and uh, you know you could be in a shop, for instance, buying a sword, and you could chime in and say, gee, that sword's not worth a tenth of what that guy's asking. I know, but we're gonna get one for a third that price. And Yolo, on the other hand, who's the bard, Yolo is like your best friend. And so throughout the game, Yolo will chime in and give you advice and consultation. And when push comes to shove, it's usually Yolo's advice that's correct. 
Shamano, on the other hand, Shamano is the one who is your ranger character. He's the one who knows the land. Shamano is one with Britannia. And the reason why that is the case, by the way, in case for those of you who didn't already know it, Shamano is another alter ego of myself. And so I'm a very fortunate individual. I get to be there as Richard Garriott often. I get to be there as Lord British. And also Shamano is a character represented by myself. And so Shamano, since he is the one that knows the most about the land, he's the one that can chime in and tell you where you are when you find certain dungeons or cave entrances. He's the one that is, can, has his ear to the ground and can hear when monsters are coming and detect things from afar. Ultima 6 also wraps up the second trilogy of the Ultima series. Ultima 6 is another storyline involving virtue and morals and ethics of you, the individual personal player. You may have also noticed, by the way, let me rewind even a little bit here through Ultima 4 that carries through to 5 and 6, which is character creation. Uh, in most role-playing games, including the earliest Ultimas, your character was created by rolling dice or assigning numbers to attributes, and this character that you would create is essentially your alter ego, where uh, uh, you might be a... Uh, skinny little computer guy sitting over here behind your computer but you can run a big evil barbarian if you want to as your alter ego in ultima and ultimas 4 5 and 6 in particular since the stories involved ethical and moral decisions made by you as an individual it was more important to me that this character be really you not your alter ego but really you which is why you'll notice that the introduction screens to ultima and the character creation all is there to support how you, a real person from the real world, find your way traveling to and from Britannia. And the character creation itself, the, as you answer the questions, the ethical dilemmas that the, that the uh, character creation poses to you, the more you answer questions that, that show honesty and the search for truth, uh, things of this nature, the more it, it raises your intelligence and the more it drives you towards being a mage or an alchemist kind of a character, the guys in search of truth. And the more you answer questions for valor and courage, the more that would drive up your strength and drive you towards being a fighter kind of a character. And the more you answer questions favoring things like compassion and love, the more that would drive you towards more of the artistic kinds of endeavors and it would raise your dexterity. Uh, in that way, we build a character who is more accurately a direct uh, echoing of what you truly are like as an individual. Uh, you may have a character who is bigger and stronger than you are, for instance, but is much more of a personality match to you as an individual, which has been very important to uh, this second trilogy. So another thing that's really good to probably point out about this point in time is that uh, truly I am very much enjoying this opportunity to express to you my feelings and how important the Ultima series is and has been to me as an individual. Uh, hopefully you've gleaned from this that truly Ultima for me is much more than just a game. It's more than just a product. It's, it's not just what I do to make money. Ultima is what I do for my own personal fulfillment, for my own enjoyment. And a very important part of this is also the feedback that I get from users such as yourself. And so, if you feel compelled at all by what I've said to you on this tape or what you've seen in my games uh, to express to me what you feel is important about what I'm doing or which, what, what things you feel I'm doing wrong, what things you feel I'm doing right, I very much appreciate that kind of input and feedback from those individuals and truly, for those of you that have written in before, uh, it, it does mean for a great deal for me, not just in the sense of, uh, of hearing from them, but also to hear their critiques as well. So uh, any of you that would ever feel compelled to write in, please, please feel free to do and, and know that it will be read and it will be appreciated. And of course, as long as I have a personal tie with you here today, uh, it might be fun, of course, to give you a little bit of clues and insights as to how to get going in Ultima 6, or uh, how, in fact, uh, to speed along your quests. If, uh, if you'd like to hear such things, don't worry, I won't give anything away, but if you don't want to hear any clues at all, you might as well want to skip a little ways ahead here. Uh, but first of all, let me uh, point out that uh, one of the first things that throws off a lot of our playtesters is the very first moment you have in the game starts with a battle. And so those of you who are uninitiated to the world of Ultima may be uh, a little bit uh, taken aback by that first battle because uh, you, it'll be the swords will be flying and arrows, things of this nature, so uh, you may want to watch your head. However, since your good companions, Yolo and Dupre and Shemino are fighting there with you, 
In fact, all you have to do is press the space bar to pass and just pass your turn and just walk out of the way and your companions will complete the, the, the battle for you, uh, presumably successfully. Uh, but uh, one of the other first things in any Ultima that it takes is, is of course, getting money. Uh, money is one of the things that oftentimes before you can outfit your group and make uh, very strong progress on your quests, even as you figure out what your quests are, you need money to buy your adventuring supplies. And uh, so there are many ways to do that in this game. Not only, of course, when you fight monsters to collect treasure from them as you can in most role-playing games and in earlier Ultimas, but this time around you can actually work within the, the simulated ecosystem that exists within the game. For instance, uh, you can go and you can buy grain from a farmer, you can take the grain to the flour mill and have it ground into flour. You can take the flour to a baker and have him sell the flour to the baker and then buy some bread and along the way hopefully make yourself some money. Uh, and so quite literally, if you're a beginning character, that one of the, might, might be one of the ways you uh, decide to do that. Similarly, for instance, you can take an empty bucket, you can go and milk a cow, you can take the bucket of milk over to a butter churn and make yourself some butter. Not necessarily a very tasty way to, uh, to keep your uh, group fed, but uh, it at least will work, and in fact you can make some money usually in that route as well. Similarly, you can do things with starting with the raw materials of sheep and wool and carry that all the way to thread and cloth and clothing. Uh, those ways are, those are good ways for a beginner to uh, start collecting money without endangering their life uh, particularly. Also, there are fishing poles that you might be able to find or acquire sometime along in your quest. You can go out and go fishing to also supplement your food supplies. Uh, lastly, of course, uh, gold itself. There are some uh, dungeons which are mine shafts, and if you take a shovel or a pickaxe down into the mine shaft, you can oftentimes find the mother load on your own. A couple of clues for a little further along in the game uh, might be two things here. Uh, first of all, one of the quests that you'll need will require you to find the gypsies. Uh, the gypsies, of course, are uh, traveling bands of individuals who travel from city to city, and there are multiple groups of gypsies. And some of the gypsies uh, I would uh, label as being good gypsies, and some of the label I would say as uh, not so good gypsies. Uh, but the gypsies you need to find, by the way, I will give you a clue, are led by a person named Zoltan. And so if you can find the group of gypsies led by Zoltan, you have probably found your way. However, Zoltan's group does travel back and forth between three different cities, so they will be a little more difficult to find than just to wander into one city and grab them. Another one that uh, is a very important key path that uh, might be helpful is Captain John. Captain John uh, is a character who uh, you will understand fairly early on as key to the solution, but locating him will be a uh, subject of some debate. Uh, many people will tell you different locations where you may have gone, but I, of course, will tell you the truth. He has traveled into the dungeon Hithloth. And so if you can travel to the very base of the dungeon Hithloth, just before it comes out on the other side of the world, that is where you should find Captain John. Well, I'm about out of time here. In fact, I overshot the mark that I was told to shoot for by a significant margin already. Uh, I'd just like to close with a comment about the fact that when I began the Ultima series and was working literally out of my closet in my home in Houston, that it has really come a long way since then. Uh, it's been a, a long, hard struggle in many ways, but fortune has turned my way in many ways as well. But uh, in total, it's still a great deal of fun for me. And I sincerely hope that you too enjoy the work and effort that we put in Ultima 6. Uh, I hope you will also stick with me past Ultima 6 and onto the future Ultimas. It'd be very difficult for me at this point in time to predict how long they're going to last, but as long as it remains fun for me, and as long as it remains fun for you, indicated hopefully by the fact that people are still buying them, which will allow me to stay in the business of continuing to make them, uh, we'll hopefully work together on into the future and have many, many more years of fun with Ultimas to come.